I guess, ACL injuries in, in field-based team sports. doesn't have to be AFL-specific, but um, in what you've seen in your work, what are some of the most common causes of, a, of an ACL injury? Yeah, so we still see a substantial proportion of them having in, happening in non-contact scenarios, and, and um, the proportion of that uh, varies predominantly by um, the split of men's and women's competitions, but nonetheless, they, they still exist in both cohorts. Um, and independent of the rules of the game, there's something about the situation having an extended knee, placing you in a, a risky scenario, and the situations in which that occurs is often sidestepping, decelerating, or landing from jumps. That That has been a pretty steady description of how most ACLs occur across multiple sports, whether that's a rectangular field or a round field, whether it's a 360 degree game. The mechanisms you, you mentioned, um, what are some of your, you know, with our coaches hat on, what are some of your sort of non-negotiables with that in mind when you're going to a new squad, I guess, and you're putting a program in place and um, and you think, and they have had ACL issues uh, with their program. Some factors are innate. You can't, well, I'm going to put an asterisk, you can't change it quickly. So like people's tibial plateau, it's a bone. It's bloody, one of the slower tissues to adapt. But we know bone morphologically can adapt. We're just a little angst that the, it'll take years for that to occur. And, and a lot of the bone morphology is um, more responsive to the things that you do through and, and after puberty in those key years. So when you come in, you have to consider, there'll be a couple people here that are susceptible to through the things that are either very slow to adapt or you could never change it. Family history of ACL injury. And that probably lends to maybe skeletal morphology, joint laxity, hypermobility, um, other factors that predispose you like FAI. With working with the youth, do you feel like that's achievable? Like you've got a bit more of a clean canvas or is it just, that's just the way that we move due to, you know, our family history and the way that we've we've always done things no matter what the age um, or have you found that you actually can sort of get to that point the ideal where they'll they'll rely more often than not on the on a, on a different strategy depending on the task yeah like like anything the the earlier we can we can broaden it's fundamental movement and it's like make fundamental movement great again like running jumping throwing, catching, tracking, moving objects, all those, all those fundamental movement skills, the, the more they can broaden that, the more they can call upon them in situations, maybe uncommon to call upon them. And, and that, that, that's that idea. And, and we, I don't, there's, there's much better people to talk about this around talent transfer than I, but um, I work with really good people so I can copy the things I hear them say. And, um, you know, there, there are people that can go through a pathway of movement and say they started in footy and they always stay in footy and they end in footy and they have lots of ways to move in a footy context. But there's also people and benefits that we see from people that could equally play basketball as they could play soccer as they could play footy and, and how they brought in the cre even the creativity of movement because of the ways in which those sports shove you to movement. Do you want to put them... Do you want to put that sort of deep knee flexion based work at the end where they have their longest rest or, or does the, the gym pretty safe place and it's more the straining, the axle, D cell stuff we need to be mindful of with the strain to the respect to strain to ACL? The literature, and this is correlational, not causal, but when they ask people to reflect on increases or, or what they did in the six months prior to their ACL they highlighted ramps in ACL straining activities. Um, and um, that not that didn't necessarily, that wasn't pointing to resistance training, that was pointing to game-based play, high intensity um, activities. So I would say that those are probably more damaging mm -hmm. at a rate that's really difficult to repair. Whereas mm -hmm. just like muscle tissue damage, in, in the weight room, we're, we're pretty careful in the magnitude of damage, right? Mm -hmm. We stop before failure. And would there be any way or any technology that we could put in place to sort of monitor the strain of an ACL over pre-season season to put some things in place to, yeah, manage their loads or, yeah, to help 
manage players and prevent the you know, ACL injuries. In the future, hopefully, maybe we will probably get to the point where we can broadly predict what's occurring at at least the knee and hip. And, and there's other people that are looking into this. Some of the work um, from Jacqueline Alderson's group at um, University of Western Australia, they've been in this space for a really long time. At some point we will get there, but we're not yet there. Um, so unfortunately the, the simple answer is no, the technology is not there yet. Um, first grade evidence will be trying to find measures that parallel to the amount of damage or strain. There's still some work being done. There's people that agree that um, what's a T2 relaxation um, MRI is indicative of the amount of collagen damage. That work shows some promise, but it's not to the point where I'd be telling everybody to do it, but it's at the point where I think that's where the research may go.